You're listening to the Common Descent Podcast. Hello, Will. Hello, David. And hello, listeners, and welcome to episode 101. Dalmatians. Of, of the Common Descent. We already did the dogs episode. If we had had foresight, we would have done dogs here. It would have been it would have been real fun. But no, we are doing sauropods <laughs> this episode. We are coming back to dinosaurs. We figured it was time for another dinosaur episode. Yeah, kick off the triple digits with something exciting. And what more exciting and iconic group of dinosaurs than sauropods? These are your. Brachiosaurus, Apatosaurus, uh, little foot style dinosaurs, long necks, long tails, pillar like legs. They are famous for how diverse they were, for how successful they were, mm -hmm. for how weird they are mm -hmm. compared to modern animals. But above all, they are famous for how ridiculously big they got. They were very large. These are we today, we are talking about. The largest land animals of all time. Yes. by And by a wide margin. And it's not even close. Yeah, that that's always the thing that blows <laughs> me away is typically when it's like, here's the biggest thing. There's usually a, a gradient up to it. Right. There's not a gradient. No. <laughs> There's a big old step up to sauropods. Yeah. If you were to make a list of the top hundred largest species of animals that have ever lived on land... All hundred of them would probably be sauropods. Yes. So in this episode, we are going to talk about what they are, what features they have, a bit of history on the group. We're going to go into their evolution, their diversity, where they fit into the Mesozoic ecosystems. And we are going to talk a bit about how they functioned and what allowed them to be as colossally huge as they are. I'm really excited to talk about it because I, I I would argue that sauropods are probably the most recognizable group of dinosaurs. They are they are one of the most classic like like the, like there are lots of animals that it's not uncommon to hear people mistake them for being dinosaurs mm -hmm, or mistake mm -hmm. them for not being dinosaurs. Yes, I I feel like sauropods probably are the most recognizable among the general public the general populace well and it's sauropods as a overall group and this is kind of the thing that's interesting with them is not just a single individual type like with a lot of other groups but it's like sauropods in general are as famous as like t-rex and triceratops yes like when you have when you get the thing of dinosaur bath toys or stickers or <laughs> whatever it is there's a sauropod in it. Yep. I, I almost I will bet money almost every time. At least as much as any other dinosaur, sauropods are synonymous with the concept of dinosaurs. Mm -hmm. This episode was requested a lot. Yeah. This is up there with turtles and pterosaurs on among our most requested episodes with the request list including Gregory, Samantha, Curtis, Catherine, Sheldon, Jonathan, Brad, Kel, Sinixi, let me know if I said that wrong uh, on YouTube, and Holly, and Finn, and Wayne. Thanks, everybody. Good suggestion. Good suggestion. A big list for a big group of animals. Before we get into that, speaking of big lists of names, let's start our announcements with Patreon. Woo! We have a Patreon. If you join Patreon, you get all sorts of cool extra stuff, including at a certain level, we will say your name in gratitude on the podcast. This episode, we are welcoming Sheridan, Scott, Marco, Peter, Steve, Noah, and Louise. Wow. Thank you so much, everyone. It is. It, it's so cool to get all these new people joining us on Patreon. Also, I got to say, in the week since we released episode 100, the amount of wonderful, lovely comments our patrons have been leaving for us, not to mention our non-patron listeners have been leaving for us, has been fantastic. It's it, heartwarming. If reaching 100 wasn't encouraging and like b bolstering of our spirits enough, this outpouring of support 
is that's good for another hundred episodes. I, at least. I was about to say, <laughs> yeah, it makes you it makes you feel like doing another hundred episodes. <laughs> hey, speaking of Patreon stuff, in honor of our hundred episodes, we are planning a live stream event for our patrons. So if you're a patron, keep an eye out for that. By the time this episode comes out, there will hopefully be an announcement. Assuming we don't run into weird Patreon snags yep. or, or live streaming snags, keep an eye out for that. Uh, and if it goes well, maybe we'll do more stuff like that. Indeed. Speaking of special stuff, if you missed it, we recently released a retrospective episode. A uh, hundred episodes, a look back, which is us being nostalgic and feeling feelings and rambling a bunch for about an hour. Uh, just about how how it feels to have done a hundred episodes. Yeah, well, and just looking at what the podcast was and what it's become and all that good stuff. And it was it was a lot. It was very cathartic to just get to reminisce and and gratuitously thank all of our listeners, all of you listeners. Absolutely. And hey, not only did we recently hit a hundred episodes, but also it's almost the end of the year. Woo! So we are doing another end of the year Q and A. If you have a question you'd like us to answer on our end of the year Q&A, serious, scientific, silly, or whatever, go to our Q&A form. We will put a link in the description of this episode. We've also been posting and resharing the link on our social media. So we, we love doing the end of the year Q&A, and already we are receiving just a deluge of responses. So this is there's going to be a lot. I'm so excited. It's going to be real good. So we've got all sorts of cool special stuff coming up before we nap for a week i'm sure <laughs> at the end of this year but that's our announcements for now which means it is time to move on to our first major section which is the news news every episode we like to pick some exciting news from paleontology evolution our favorite sciences your favorite sciences maybe you're listening to this podcast at least you like them a bit i mean statistically someone we were correct someone listening we were correct when we said that that's true you you know who you, you are specifically yeah Will, what news do you bring from the world today? A weird-mouthed shark. Okay, I'm on board with sharks. This is a Devonian shark, so very old, that has a peculiar jaw structure that may have played a, a strong role in how it fed and may or may not have been characteristic of sharks at this time. This is research by Linda Frey et al. in Communications Biology. And the article is by Enrico de Lazaro in Sci News. So this fossil shark, uh, not super big, a pretty small shark, is from Morocco in, as I said, late Devonian rock. So they said about 365 million years old. This is a about 13 inch shark, it seemed, 33 centimeters, and is of a new genus and species, Ooh. as far as they can tell. And is called Feromirum okerbushai. Would have had a fairly slender body and very large eyes. And then, as I mentioned, specialized jaws. Cool. From the description, it it's a Simoriform shark, which is a particular group of sharks. And overall is a pretty normal looking, or, you know, old shark. You know, it doesn't quite look like our sharks. You know, it would look weird swimming around a day, but it doesn't look weird weird for a shark right fits in with the weird devonian ancient sharks yeah but the jaws have one particular feature which is that they are not fused at the chin oh the two dentary bones so you know the two bones of the lower jaw are typically fused in many groups right at what we call the symphysis the your symphysis. jaws you 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 know who you are you, same you, same you from before. same person uh the two sides of your jaw are different bones that fuse in the middle of the chin and this is true for a lot of vertebrates. Yeah, not the best ones, but yeah. most of them. <laughs> yeah. But in modern sharks, even though it's cartilage, so it's not bone, it is, it's fused there. This shark, it was not. Hmm. Which, mean, which means, much like David's, you know... Best animals. Clouted best animals. Best animals. Uh, second placers in the polls. In case anyone, this is your first episode <laughs> of the podcast, we're talking about snakes. <laughs> Much like snakes, this would have allowed the shark's jaw to not only open down, but outward. Mm -hmm. And that's that's what lets snakes eat such large meals. With this shark, it would have allowed them to drop down and outward, but also rotate outward. Oh, interesting. So they would have rotated open more exposing the inner rows of teeth Ooh. so as many people probably know 
sharks replace their teeth, and famously they replace it in a conveyor belt row system. So instead of stacking them like ice cream cones in your crocs, or, you know, a slightly similar but side-by-side -side stacking in most other reptiles, they have a complete row of teeth, and behind that, another complete row of teeth, and behind that, another complete row of teeth. And depending on the shark you're looking about at, you could go two or three more times. Yep. <laughs> well, the front rows of teeth are the ones that get worn because they're the ones being used, and the inner rows are ridiculously fresh and sharp. And then as they come forward, you have fresh new sharp teeth that get worn down as they're used. This rotation would have exposed those inner sharp teeth. Ooh, so it could bite you with several rows of teeth. And it could have put the newest teeth into action. Ooh. So it would have been utilizing the freshest teeth right away. Cool. So this would have made it if especially good at grabbing onto food. And then when they closed the jaw, the inward rotation of the jaws would have then pushed the prey item into the mouth. Oh, uh, so the closing of the jaw... Moving the jaws back into place also brings the prey mm -hmm. further. Ooh, cool. I've said cool a lot, but this is a cool find. This is, it's really, it's really interesting. <laughs> this would have allowed this particular shark to engage in a feeding style common among many aquatic predators called suction feeding. Mm -hmm. And so suction feeding is m most popular in things like big mouth bass and groupers and stuff like that. Like a lot of fish use this where they don't have teeth, but they'll have things that grab the food further in and the way they catch the food is just by opening their mouth so wide and so fast that it creates a vacuum and water has to flow in quickly to replace that vacuum to fill the vacuum because nature adhors a vacuum and that will pull any food in front of them on a good suction into the stomach yeah just straight in <laughs> like they just and swallowed this would have allowed the shark to potentially use that feeding style so they could have been hunting a little bit differently than the chase and grab it may have been more of an inhale and then the teeth rotating them in wow. yeah you're being inhaled into a shredding machine <laughs> yes <laughs> wow we talked about uh suction feeding more in episode 77 about the fish to tetrapod transition where we talked about the opposite of having of losing that ability exactly yep yep and more sharks in episode 48 Everybody, if you want more sharks. Oh, yes. And speaking of more sharks, the authors of this paper believe that this jaw type may have been common among these Paleozoic era sharks and was lost when tooth replacement became more efficient. Okay. If so you were, maybe it wasn't as necessary. Yeah, if you were replacing your teeth quickly and efficiently and getting those sharp new teeth up front in a more timely manner, there's no reason to emphasize getting back to using them you know rotating it out to use those back teeth if they're going to be up front in a matter of a short matter of time anyway right so that that this that may be why we don't see this feeding strategy in sharks today fascinating and as always it exposes the wonderful broad topic of ancient behaviors that we don't have things quite like it today yep yeah also snake sharks Snake sharks. That's right? what I heard. And they, they do have some pictures of the, the fossil in the article. So check out the links in the blog post. And it is a very slender bodied shark. So it does have kind of a snake shark feel to it. Excellent. <laughs> Best shark. It's pretty cool. <laughs> Best shark 2020. <laughs> hey, speaking of suction feeding, my first bit of news is about walruses. <gasps> cool. Yes, listeners, if you didn't know... Walruses are suction feeders. Mm -hmm. They they trawl the bottom of the, the, the ocean, they right, the floor of their seas where they're living, and they slurp up mollusks and stuff. Yes, and while the suction feeding we were talking about in fish is more of a gasp, this is like a like a high powered Dyson vacuum cleaner. <laughs> oh yeah, no, they're they're <laughs> sucking things up the way you would. Like yeah. if you ever if you like put a, an M and M on the table or something, you just go. <laughs> Yeah, it's like like we do with a straw, but yep. they're doing it to shellfish. <laughs> yeah, and it's cool. This research identifies 12 new specimens of ancient walrus, including three new species. Wow. One of which is an important, uh, 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 interesting thing we didn't know walruses did. Uh, you'll see. <laughs> this is research by Jacob Buer 
Jorge Velez Huarbe and James Parham in the Journal of Vertebrate Paleontology. And in the blog post, we will link to a press release on Eureka Alert. Today, there is but one species of walrus. Yes, the uh, walrus. The walrus. Odobenus rosmaris. Uh, they live in the Arctic. They've got those big old tusks. They're sucking up mollusks. You know what a walrus is. They look is. like Jamie Heineman. They look... <laughs> <laughs> yes, a uh, uh, job of the hut with big teeth and a uh, mustache. The lineage of modern, sort of familiar-looking walruses goes back several million years, but in the Miocene, there were many groups of early walruses. So, mm -hmm. more basal, earlier lineages of the group Odobenidae, the walruses, dating between around 17 and 6 million years ago. These early groups looked quite different. Uh, they had, so uh, uh, modern walruses tend to have peg-like teeth in most of their mouths because they're suction, you know, they're not having to use complex teeth mm -mm. like we see in most mammals. But early, these early walrus groups had much more complex teeth. The, the crowns, remember episode 88 about teeth, the tooth crowns the were very complex. The top, right, the, 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 the business end of the teeth because <laughs> they were eating fish. There was a diversity of these different walruses, and notably, they were tuskless. They had canines, canine teeth, like seals and sea lions and many mammals. <laughs> Normal canines. Normal canines. Which is one of those <laughs> one of those funny features where that's weird for a walrus. But walrus canines are weird, so right. it's actually normal. <laughs> it's like describing a whale without a horn sticking out of its face. Yes, yep. It's like, that's not weird. No, yep. you're the weird one. <laughs> In this study, the researchers identified 12 new specimens from Southern California, uh, dating to around all, all between 5 to 10 million years ago, so late Miocene epoch, from Santa Cruz County, Los Angeles County, and Orange County. And in the press release, the lead author is quoted as saying that Orange County is the most important area for fossil walruses in the world. Wow. How about that? Go so Cal. Yeah, go Orange County. Already there are three species of basal odobenids, so these early walruses, known from the late Miocene in this region. Of these new specimens, uh, two of the already existing species are identified among them, but the rest belong to new species. Three new species, which means we're doubling the number of these early walrus group, uh, uh, species in this area. Wow. One specimen from the Capistrano Formation has been named Pantolis konoi for a Japanese fossil walrus researcher named Naoki Kono. Three specimens from the Monterey Formation are identified as Pantolis barinai, named after uh, USGS geologist John Barron. And a further three specimens, also from the Capistrano Formation, are a new genus and species, Osotobenus eodon. The last two that have multiple specimens include males, females, and juveniles. Whoa. So not only new walruses, but like a decent look at these species. A good collection. Always exciting to find new species. Always exciting to increase the diversity of a community, of an ecosystem in the past. But the walrus among these that is really taking the, the headlines is that last one, Osotobenus, because it has tusks. Hey! Like I said, these early, these basal walruses don't have tusks. This one breaks the trend. Now, it doesn't have tusks quite like modern walruses. They're not quite as long. They're like a warthog's. <laughs> <laughs> no. They are the upper canines, like in modern walruses. They are... Like I said, not quite as long as today's, but about three times longer than the other species among these groups that live at the same time. Yeah, so it's still notably tusk-like. Intermediate, right? Because the difference between a canine and a tusk is a degree. Yeah, exactly. At what point is it a tusk? It's a, it's a... <laughs> but it is the first of these ancient walruses to have tusks. And it doesn't appear to be part of the same lineages as, as modern walruses, suggesting that this is a convergent, independent evolution of long canines. Interesting. And if you're thinking, well, I wonder if they were also behaving similarly, listen to this. Osotobenus also has particular holes in the front of the skull that are the same sort of morphology we see in modern walruses, 
that are associated with the nerves for their whiskers, mm-hmm. which they use while rooting around on the seafloor for food. Yeah, when if you ever see a walrus get interested in something, all of the that mustache just rotates forward, and all the whiskers start feeling whatever's in front of them. Yup, it's awesome. Also, Osoto Benis has an arched palate, so the roof of the mouth has this particular shape which is also seen in modern walruses and associated with suction feeding. Mm -hmm. So it seems we might be looking at a basal walrus, late Miocene, outside modern group of walruses, that evolved tusks and mouth structures and behavior, possibly for a convergent uh, feeding style. Wow, that's fascinating. It's always especially weird to me. Like, I I love convergent evolution. It's amazing episode 70 but it's always particularly weird to me when it happens within a group yeah uh, but still unrelated lineages right multiple times within the same group. boy you're gonna really like this episode right <laughs> <laughs> and i always wonder if there was like is there was there a genetic lean in those animals right you were, were maybe predisposed to make that yeah, transition that it, it was just very easy for them to start developing tusks because of something about the way their canines developed or mm-hmm. some aspect or of maybe even their lifestyle mm-hmm. and behavior and so i i always wonder what what was it that made it so easy for this group to get weird in the same way yeah multiple times and the fact that that it happened early on in walruses like that's a good way to be a walrus yeah they this i believe they said makes this the oldest known tusked walrus wow which is cool and you know last episode uh, i after one of my news is i made a comment about how we haven't talked uh, a surprising little about multi-tuberculates mm-hmm, also mm-hmm. walruses yeah super cool animals they, they really like <laughs> walruses are so much more intense and big and weird than I think we give them credit for because they've become, they're one of those weird animals that's become faint, like the kangaroo, where it's like, yeah, "Yeah, everyone knows about kangaroos. They hop around, they have a pouch. It's like, did you just hear what you said? Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) You, that, that it's become normal. We've become desensitized to how weird walruses are. Walruses are like these (laughs) massive, like huge mammals. They're so big. And then they've got swords sticking out of their mouth. Mm -hmm. And then they, but then they just suck up their food. They're not like, they're so weird. They shed yeah. their skin. They're so weird. <laughs> they're so weird. I love them. <laughs> well, my last bit of news is about dinosaurs. Okay. So I was but, I was hoping they'd come up this episode. Right? It is, uh, here's our quota. This is about how the dinosaurs were doing before they went extinct. Ooh, this is a big topic of discussion. It is. And this new research disagrees with many previous researches and suggest that they were actually doing fairly well. Yeah, I think we talked about this in episode 5 and possibly in episode 21 about how, yeah, there has been this debate over time about were dinosaurs on their way out Mm -hmm. before the big extinction or were they doing pretty well? Yes. So this is research by Joseph Bosner et al. in the Royal Society Open Science and the press release is in Sci News again. And so this analysis was taking a look at dinosaur lineages before the end Cretaceous extinction. Because as you were saying, there is still debate as to whether or not, basically, would dinosaurs have gone extinct or likely have gone extinct anyway without that meteor impact? Or would they have continued on? That's a big, you know, that's kind of an obvious question is, if you didn't shoot them, would they have kept going? (laughs) And... A lot of research has come out with support that it looked like they were already not doing well or that speciation rates were down or that the environment was not as stable, that things were already rough and then they got hit with a big rock Mm -hmm. and that put an end to them, but that they already weren't doing as well as they have been. Right. They were on the decline, maybe left exposed to the effects of a mm-hmm. mass extinction. And some of you suggested that maybe would have gone extinct anyway. Mm-hmm. If if not as soon, still not, not in too long. This research took another look at it because there are some things that indicate that dinosaurs, dinosaurs weren't like 
actively disappearing before the impact. They were found on every continent still at that time. They were still the dominant terrestrial group and found in most ecosystems. So, like, it's not like there were suddenly patches of no dinosaurs. They were still everywhere. It just, some research seems like they may have not been doing as well as they had been. This study took kind of a wider view and collected a set of dinosaur family trees and used statistical modeling to assess how the different groups, the main groups, were doing and whether or not they were still able to produce new species. They took statistical uh, steps to try to overcome sampling bias, biases, and what they were focusing on was that speciation rate rather than simply what were the numbers doing. Mm -hmm. to see whether or not they could have continued to produce new species and therefore because even if they were on a decline if they're still producing new species they could bounce back and so rather than just look at the raw numbers they looked at this and what they found was that they looked like the dinosaurs could have done fine had that impact not happened right they they were still diversifying they yes. were still they were still actively evolving and speciating and the researchers point out that if you expand the data set to expand more of the recent dinosaur groups the latest dinosaur groups you see that it shows a very different pattern and what they basically showed was that taking this point of view instead of it looking leaning toward they were on the decline it actually comes more of a 50 50 hmm. with just about as many points pointing to them doing fine as maybe declining and so this this at least makes the decision a little less clear mm -hmm. and leans it a little bit more toward dinosaurs could have very well continued on doing as well as they had been without the meteor impact. They also point out that part of the reason that it may seem that they are on the decline is very likely just due to preservation bias and collection bias. And that can make it seem like they're declining, like the species numbers are declining, even if that's not actually what was happening. Right. We've talked about as uh, groups get closer to extinction, you are th the, the, the fossil record starts to drop off before the actual extinction mm -hmm. event. And in their study, they actually found the opposite for some groups. Ceratopsians and hadrosaurs, so your horned and duck-billed dinosaurs, were doing fine mm -hmm. yeah, and I've seemed to that. actually be thriving. So it's once again, it isn't going to like solve the debate, but it seems like dinosaurs may have actually or very potentially been doing all right, or at least there seems to be as much evidence on that side of the scale as they were already on their way out. Yeah, from what from what I've read and seen, it seems like this perspective seems to be the more mm -hmm. commonly uh, resolved in research. I've seen a lot of recent studies and writings that suggest that, yeah, di the, the, the previous inferences that dinosaurs were on the way out doesn't quite hold up, at least not for all groups. Mm -hmm. So that it, it and, and, and that always is kind of the idea that I've had, and I cling to it. Partially, I, I read it places, but also it's a very, it makes it more tragic. It does. That it wasn't like... They were on their last legs and then the whole of dinosaur diversity, except for that little tiny bit, got wiped out Th that they were actually doing pretty well. Yeah. Like some of the groups arguably at their peak, mm -hmm. like what you mentioned, tri uh, uh, Ceratopsians and Hadrosaurs were doing really well, dominating in the late Cretaceous, and then they got unlucky. Well, and the, the thing that fascinates me about this is this is another one of those examples of paleontology science and specifically dinosaur understanding that has at least notably shifted on the public side in our lifetimes because mm -hmm. like walking with dinosaurs the famous dinosaur documentary that came out when we were younger proposes and presents the idea that dinosaurs were already suffering when the impact hit and i had i remember that in many of the books i read as a kid mm -hmm. and then that has shifted as we've taking a closer look at various groups and taking a taking a step back and looked at it from different angles which i also like not only because it it makes it more tragic but also it it i love the narrative that without that meteor us 
us smart mammals would have never yeah. <laughs> gotten a chance. <laughs> <laughs> it's, that was that was our window, and without it, the dinosaurs would have reigned supreme. Yeah, it's a nice thought. <laughs> hey, speaking of nice thoughts, my last bit of news is about snakes. This it's a pretty nice thought. It's almost this the is research <laughs> that identifies a new fossil species of blind snake. In fact, Ooh. the oldest known fossil of blind snakes. Ooh. This is research by Tiago Schneider Fascini et al. in the journal I Science. And there will not be a popular article because there is not a popular article. So <gasps> in the blog post, we will link to just the paper, which is open access, so you can read it. It'll be technical, but what can I say? They don't write about snake fossils most unfortunately so here is your definitive I, I discussion wonder, i wonder why about snakes <laughs> <laughs> we have blind snakes today uh blind snakes include several families several different groups within a a, a broad group called scolecophidia uh that are basal snake groups so early branching compared to the uh, most other snakes that we have today these tend to be small burrowing snakes so usually they are less than 30 centimeters, right? Less than a foot long, fossorial, you know, hanging out in the sediment and the dirt. Uh, they are called blind snakes because much like moles and other, you know, crawling around things, they are reduced eyes. They, they look kind of wormy. Yes, they do. As you might imagine, for small, wormy, burrowing creatures, they do not have a particularly good fossil record. Mm-mm. Uh, the oldest fossil blind snakes come from the late Paleocene, early Eocene, around 55 million years ago in Europe and Morocco. But DNA suggests that they originated most likely in the Mesozoic, late Jurassic to early Cretaceous. This new find is a fossil of a blind snake from late Cretaceous Brazil somewhere between probably 66 and 80 million years old or so, making it the oldest known blind snake. Nice. The fossil is a vertebra with part of another vertebra associated with it. <laughs> As is the case with many snake fossils identified off of backbones. Well, it's I like that aspect also because it's one of those where just like, just statistically, based on the number of bones in a snake, yeah, ev even regardless of how delicate their skull is, yeah. If you were just to randomly draw a snake bone out of a bag, you're going to yeah. draw... It'd be a rib. <laughs> It'd be a rib. Ribs aren't helpful, so yep. it's a vertebra. <laughs> they named the new snake Boipeba tayasuensis. Boi means snake. Peba means flattened, uh, named for the shape of the vertebra. And it is from the Tayasu municipality in Sao Paulo, Brazil. So, oldest known blind snake reduces that gap between the fossil record and the DNA suggestion of when they originated. Phylogeny, so comparing it with other snakes, suggests that it is a close cousin of the group of blind snakes called Typhlopoidea, which suggests that that group of blind snakes may have originated in West Gondwana, right? Southern continents. Mm -hmm. But the big news about this snake is that it's big. The vertebra, the, the complete one, is about seven millimeters long, which is a Good-sized vertebra for a blind snake. The researchers compared it with living Scolecophidian species to get a length estimate, and they estimated that this snake might have been 1.1 meters in length. 1.1 meters in length! Whoa! Which is pretty darn big compared to modern Scolecophidians. Uh, some modern blind snakes can get almost a meter, but this one we're talking about some somewhere around three and a half feet long. Yeah, that's like that would be that is a not bad size for like a random snake I find in my backyard. Yeah, like, that's like a good garter snake, rattlesnake size. Yeah. And indeed, similar to most Mesozoic snakes. So this is a similar size to a lot of the those other Cretaceous snakes that we see. We talked about those in episode three. OK, this suggests that blind snakes may have started large and then got smaller over time. It's uh, The authors suggest that this, uh, their analysis at least, their phylogenetic analysis, at least suggests that this miniaturization through their evolution might have happened in multiple different lineages of blind snakes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Which is not only cool to know, it tells us how blind snakes got started, 
suggests that what we have today of blind snakes might be a very specialized morphology, right? Not only specialized, they've got all sorts of weird skull stuff going on, but even their size might be a specialty of these lineages. But also, oftentimes we look at the most basal groups of a, of a group of animals, right? The earliest branching groups as possibly indicative of ancestry. Mm -hmm. That these being the more early branching snakes might tell us something about the most ancient snakes. And if you remember from episode three, there is a famous debate about how snakes got started. Were they burrowing? Were they aquatic? And if you look at blind snakes and say, oh, well, that's probably how they started. Well, those are burrowers. Those are Mm -hmm. a, a point in support for that suggestion. But if it is true that they started larger started different from what blind snakes are today, then maybe they're not such a good indication of what early snakes were like. Intriguing. I, I like this because it's it, it kind of reminds me of the walrus news, where it, it, this may be an indication that this is not a large blind snake, but that today's blind snakes are small, which is neat. Yeah. Is, is a weird flip, especially because, you know, there's the famous generalization that often groups get bigger over time yes i believe that's cope's rule Mm -hmm. and this is a miniaturization yes which is a a, once again a cool inverse and it's exciting if this is able to give us clues to early snake behavior because snakes fall into one of those categories kind of like bats and stuff where you're a weird you're like a very particular specialized morphology with not a super great early fossil record and there's a lot of answers that could explain why you are the way you are but right we just don't know and you we, our, our analysis has become clouded by the fact that even with your special morphology you've become incredibly diverse yeah exactly like like bats it's not like it's more it's like super more logical that they really just should be burrowers i mean look at them no, they could be aquatic just as easily as burrowers right. or arboreal. they have changed so much mm-hmm. from how they started. So I, early snake stuff is always exciting. And early rare snakes. Yes. Real cool stuff. Well, I also like blind snakes getting some attention because, and I don't know the numbers at all, but I know that blind snakes are way more common oh, yeah. than we, the common person, tend to think because you don't see them because they're underground. They are all over the planet. But they're everywhere. They're like one of the more common groups. If you knew how, if you could magically just find blind snakes, you could find them regularly almost all the time. Yeah. In fact, one species uh, that's around today, the Brahmini blind snake, mm-hmm. is considered the most widespread snake on the planet. Right, right. I remember, uh, I remember that coming up. In part because they've been accidentally transported all over the world. In well, dirt. In soil, yes. yes. Uh, you move plants around and you end up with these <laughs> these snakes on the on, on your dirt. Well, it's, it's amazing how quickly, even though we know that there's stuff living in dirt, that we, how quickly we forget and just think of dirt as an inorganic, inert, inert object. And it's like, no, scoop full of dirt. There's an ecosystem you just scooped up. Yep. If you take it somewhere it else, Florida. <laughs> that ecosystem is there now. <laughs> well, speaking of big, long things, let's move on to our feature presentation. Uh, uh, much bigger. Yes. Not at the beginning. Oh. Ooh. Mm-hmm. Sauropods after the break. Early in the year 2016, the American Museum of Natural History up in Manhattan in New York, my museum, my childhood museum, opened a new exhibit featuring the fully mounted replica skeleton of a dinosaur that would the next year was named Patagotitan, but at the time was just called the Titanosaur, and I think that's still what the signs say above the room. And I went to go see it, and... I, I, I've seen dinosaurs on display, but this particular specimen stands out in my mind because it, more than any other dinosaur skeleton I've ever seen, it is just awesome in, in the, in the traditional yes. sense of the word, 
full of awe. Yes, instilling awe. Instilling awe by how big it is. It is difficult to describe the feeling of standing next to this skeleton, looking up at its elbow, at its knee, and just imagining this creature in life. It is so big. And it's a defining experience to stand next to one of the largest animals that has ever walked on the planet. And I know that you have a story like that. Absolutely. No, it is humbling. My childhood museum, the Fernbank Museum in Atlanta, opened a display with giants of the Mesozoic, which had a Giganotosaurus. Yeah, big theropod. One of the biggest theropods to ever live. And it is stunningly huge. Like, the skull of that thing is just so long. Oh, yeah. And it's just ridiculous. And it is posed next to Argentinosaurus, another giant sauropod. Yep. And at that time, one of the biggest known. And still. Yes, like, that was... Patagotitan Argentinosaurus are rough, very similar in size. And you have this Giganotosaurus there, you know, with jaws open. It's all awesome. And then you just scan over... And it is dwarfed yeah. by this just truly massive skeleton. And it's, yeah, it's hard to fathom. It's like trying to hold the concept of a billion in your head. Yeah. It's like, how in the world did that thing be alive? <laughs> These are sauropods. Sauropods are incredible for their size. Not just for their size, for their diversity. Sauropods are found all over the planet. They come in all different shapes and sizes. They go, they, they span pretty much the entire age of dinosaurs and they are successful the entire time. Mm-hmm. Sauropods share a number of defining features, mainly the obvious ones. They have big bodies with uh, four column-like legs. Yeah, very elephant-esque. Very much like elephants. Their feet and even their hands are adapted for maximum support like elephants. And then, of course, they have long, long tails. Many of them very, very long tails. Just crazy long. And then their most famous feature, of course, their necks. Mm-hmm. Long necks, and at the end of the long necks, small heads with, in most cases, fairly simple teeth. Yeah. But the absolute most famous aspect of sauropods is their size. Now, like I said, sauropods came in many different sizes, but what makes them impressive are the numbers that they consistently hit. Yeah, it's not that all sauropods are the massive giants that we were just discussing, but those massive giants are not like a one or two off. No, and even average sauropods were super impressive. So let's talk sizes for a second. Let's set <laughs> some baselines. The largest living land animals are elephants. Yes. Elephants regularly hit several tons, right? Five, six tons. I've seen uh, uh, comments of record setters around, you know, 10 tons or thereabouts. There are a bunch of extinct elephant cousins, mammoths, mastodons, etc. Episode 66, that are over 10 tons. Some, like, the largest land mammals of all time Mm -hmm. include certain proboscideans that may have been around 20 tons in weight. There are also the other contender for largest mammal group of all time, the Andricotheres, like the famous Paraceratherium, also estimated at over 15 tons. These are very big animals. Yeah, anyone who's been next to, even just like at a zoo, but like close enough that you could consider it next to an elephant, massive, huge, impressive animals. Very big. Like, our cars that we drive are probably one and a half to two tons. Yes. A good elephant's like six tons. And the big, these big mammals were in the 15 to 20 ton range in the exceptional cases. Among dinosaurs, the biggest of most groups, right? Your theropods like T-Rex, your stegosaurs, your ankylosaurs, uh, your ceratopsians are usually coming in in the several ton range i've seen some estimates around 10 tons Mm -hmm. more commonly i'll see estimates for t-rex stegosaurus etc at seven or eight tons maybe um conveniently i'm pulling my size list here uh uh, tom holtz in his dinosaurs course online uh, syllabus and notes has this wonderful list of size estimates so most dinosaurs are coming in at 
basically elephant sizes yeah, today. It, you know, dimension wise, they're shaped very different, but overall mass, about, the, the amount of animal that yeah, there is, about a good sized elephant. Among hadrosaurs, there are a few standouts. Uh, Shantungosaurus and uh, at least one specimen of Iguanodon mm-hmm. that are estimated at maybe over 15 tons. Yeah. These are the biggest land animals of all time for the most part. We're getting easy 5 to 10 tons, some over 10, some estimated over 15, maybe some exceptional groups up to 20 tons. Real big animals. But like multiple groups hitting within a comparable size range. Right. Like several different groups of mammals and dinosaurs hitting those ranges. Which is big. Sauropods are regularly estimated at between 10 and 20 tons. Yep. They are regularly estimated, reconstructed at between 15 to 20 meters long. <laughs> we are talking 50 to 60 foot long animals. Not exceptions. That is Basically average size for sauropods. The sauropod baseline yep. is the maximum size for all other land animals. And the biggest sauropods, several different sauropods, have been estimated at well over 100 feet long, 30 meters plus, with weights of at least over 50 tons. Some estimates get them up to 80, 90, maybe even 100 tons. Yeah, the conservative estimates double <laughs> yeah. the highest potentials. These are the size of a herd of elephants. <laughs> this includes the ones we were talking about, Argentinosaurus, Patagotitan, and more. They are also, ext- uh, some of them are estimated to be extremely tall. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Those, uh, like Brachiosaurus, that are commonly reconstructed with their necks held. Yeah, more elevated. Uh, more elevated are estimated to have been up to 15 meters or more, 50 feet tall. These are astonishingly large. Like we said at the beginning of the episode, it's it saying that sauropods are the largest land animals of all time feels like an insulting o- understatement. Yes. Like, yes, that is true, but you are doing them an immense disservice by pretending that the competition is even close. Well, I feel like it's kind of how we have things today where it's like you have big animals today, which is like hippos and, you know, big bovids and rhinos. And those are big. Yep. And then you have to step up a good bit to get to elephants. Oh, yeah. At least two times the weight. And so, like, we have the situation where the biggest animals of the day on land are bigger by a substantial margin. You have to do that with elephant-sized animals again to get to baseline sauropods. And that's just one sauropod. Yes. And we have substantial evidence from footprints and skeletal assemblages that at least many of them traveled in herds. So just this wall (laughs) of flesh. (laughs) Just like a, a few hundred tons of animal in a herd. Now, I do have to just take a little, a little side note, a little sidestep for completeness sake and point out that the largest confirmed individual of blue whale weighed about 173 tons. Yes. So there's, these are land animals that could have been half the size of a blue whale. Yeah. Which is impressive. Yes, it is. (laughs) Sauropods have been famous almost since they were first discovered. Uh, The earliest sauropod bones that were scientifically named were named back in the early to mid-1800s, but back then there were only scarce remains, and many of them were misidentified, Mm -hmm. oftentimes as marine animals. Yep. Because that's where big things often are. Because surely something this large... Which I believe is why you ended up with names like Cetiosaurus, right? that whale lizard, Uh... big animal. In the late 1800s, we started to see more complete skeletons of Cetiosaurus, which is still a name that pops around today. Plus, very famously, especially in the American West, especially during the time of the Bone Wars, episode 58, we start getting complete enough skeletons to really get a sense of what these animals looked like in famous groups like Apatosaurus, Camarasaurus, Diplodocus, Brontosaurus, if that is your real name. (laughs) Othniel Charles Marsh named Sauropoda. 
the clade sauropods in 1878 to include this new group of dinosaurs that was coming to light at that time. Early views, uh, early imaginings of sauropods struggled a bit. Mm -hmm. Uh, When you look back at early paleo art uh, and depictions of sauropods, you see a lot of sauropods depicted in water. Yes. Because there was this early idea. Even back then, they they struggled with how big sauropods were. And one of the early thoughts was, surely they must have needed to walk around in water to support their girth. Which now is seen as a very archaic point of view. Right. We have since recognized that not only are sauropod bodies built for land walking, Mm -hmm. like an elephant, but we find their skeletons and their footprints very commonly in land environment including like deserts and stuff and we've been able to bring new analyses to look at the physics of the skeleton and show that it's actually not unfeasible but at the time that's perfectly logical everything we have that remotely we could compare to that size is aquatic right (laughs) and it is that big because it's aquatic like whales are huge because they float and you don't need to worry about being crushed under your own weight and as soon as a whale is out of the water, it's crushed under its own weight. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so that that's perfectly logical for the time. Just since then, it has continued to be debunked. One of the other major things, possibly the most significant aspect of sauropod anatomy, of sauropod depictions that has changed over time, is the way their necks are imagined. Mm-hmm. To this day, there are lots of arguments about how sauropods use their necks. Um, Like we said, uh, certain groups of sauropods are commonly reconstructed with the necks held upwards like a giraffe, if not perfectly vertically, at least more vertical than not. In the past, there have also, you'll see reconstructions of sauropod necks like swans. Yep. Like this wonderful s curve like curving around a lot of the old dinosaur movies like the claymation say, stuff king kong this. is one of those classic yep. where it, it's just like whipping like a cobra with the way it's moving these days there's still there are biomechanical studies there are studies that just look at the structure of the vertebrae in the neck and how they meet each other estimates of what soft tissue might have been there a lot of research has gone into asking these questions of how would you hold your neck? How much flexibility is in the neck? And there's lots of this still going on today. Oh, yeah. One of our newses was on this. Was yep. Comparison between giraffe vertebrae and sauropod vertebrae and how far they'd have to bend to actually overextend. Some studies suggest, uh, at least for certain groups, that the necks would have been held mostly horizontal. Mm-hmm. So straight out uh, uh, ahead of them. So certain groups like the like Diplodocus and Apatosaurus are often shown more horizontal. Uh, some groups are even reconstructed as having their heads sloping slightly downward. Yeah. Kind of towards the ground. And in these groups, we would imagine their heads being, you know, a few meters above ground level, right? Yeah. 10 to 15 feet up, which is, which is big for an animal sticking its head straight forward. Oh, yeah. No, that it means it's still hovering above you. And then just continues to slope upward (laughs) to this massive back. But then other groups, uh, like the brachiosaurs, are commonly reconstructed with their necks held more vertically. And some have often uh, have also looked at modern animals and pointed out that most modern animals with even slightly long necks tend to hold them up yeah and curved a bit Mm -hmm. groups like a lot of birds uh, or even you know things like rabbits which have pretty lengthy necks for a little mammal or like llamas and alpacas and llamas and alpacas and giraffes so perhaps that was the case for at least some sauropods the reality is we don't have a definitive answer on how they held their necks and honestly as we will get into they were so diverse and so varied and widespread that it could easily be that different groups of sauropods were holding their necks in different ways. I'd be shocked if that wasn't the case. And we are running into another situation of, even though giraffes are often like in the kids' books compared to, you know, we we used to have sauropods and now we have giraffes. Okay, kind of-ish. Right. But no, not really at all. <laughs> they are very different <laughs> like, animals. This is, that is a a weird goatish, you know, 
creature <laughs> on stilts with a long neck. This is a land whale yeah. <laughs> with a long neck. <laughs> this this is five elephants yeah. with very long poles at either end. Yeah, totally different. <laughs> However, sauropods did not start out looking like this. In fact, the early evolution of sauropods, or re- really the pre-evolution of sauropods, is not only quite different, but fascinating in its own right. Mm-hmm. So let's rewind the clock. Let's go way back to the late Triassic period and look at where sauropods got their start. We should have a montage of clicking clock noises as we... Yeah, we'll put... We'll we'll add that in post. (laughs) A reminder, dinosaurs are traditionally split into two main groups. Ornithischia, which includes your Triceratops, Ankylosaurus, Stegosaurus, Hadrosaurus, etc. And Saurischia, which is your theropods on one side, T-Rex, Velociraptor, Ornithomimus, and so on. And sauropods on the other. Very strange clade mates. <laughs> More specifically, sauropodomorpha, which is the name of the group that includes sauropods, but also all of their earlier cousins and ancestors. Yeah. The earliest sauropodomorphs, the ancestors of sauropods, in the late Triassic looked a lot like all early dinosaurs. Yep. They were small. So typically one to two meters long. So, you know, three to six feet or so. Bipedal, walking on their hind legs. They tended to have back legs, good for running or walking. And their hands were graspy hands, good for grabbing stuff. Like all early dinosaurs and early dinosaur cousins. Those hands were probably grabbing plants, since most of these early sauropodomorphs are thought to have been Herbivorous, maybe some I think are considered omnivorous. Yeah. So this incru- includes such famous dinosaurs as Panphagia, Chromigosaurus, uh, and Eoraptor, which was once thought to be an early theropod, hence the name Eoraptor. Yeah. Which are all from Argentina. You've got Thecodontosaurus and Pantydraco from the UK. These animals had long necks, but long neck like. What would normally be considered a long neck? Yes. Like, think of a, you know, long for a small animal, but nothing like sauropods later on. Slightly elongated necks. Yeah, I'm picturing like coelophysis, like... Right, exactly. A moderately, but, you know, notably long neck. Small skulls. Early sauropodomorphs had teeth that were tall and leaf-shaped, with lots of denticles, lots of bumps and points along them. Yeah, so it looks like a bumpy spade. They had an overbite, and this was great for shearing plant material. Uh, It's even thought that they may have had uh, small cheeks and maybe even small beaks. Oh. Good for snipping and collecting uh, plant food stuffs. Nice. Humble beginnings for this immense clade of animals eventually. Over time, the sauropodomorphs differentiate themselves from the other other early dinosaurs while the theropods become you know theropods <laughs> bigger more impressive meat eaters and the ornithischians start to look like ornithischians the early sauropodomorphs give rise to a group called prosauropods very supportive very oh they were re- they were all for it they were a big part of the success no no, no, no. prosauropods range Uh, Starting in the late Triassic and into the early Jurassic, these are starting to look more like sauropods. I love the the reconstructions I've seen of these because it looks like an animal considering to be a sauropod. So if you know Platyosaurus or Massospondylus, uh, these are larger animals. And now we're talking three, four, five, some up to eight or even ten meters long. Right? 10, 20, maybe 30 foot long animals. The bigger ones are probably weighing in at a few tons. Mm -hmm. So we're talking, you know, bison, rhino sized animals. Still bipedal. Yes. Mostly. But the back legs are, the lower legs are a bit shorter. Mm -hmm. Right? They're they're adapted a bit less for running, more for plodding. Yes. Yeah. Stomping around. Traditionally, a lot of them were thought to be facultative bipeds, which means... They could be on two feet when they needed to, but more recent studies 
have showed that the arms were really not good for walking on. Yeah. They, these really were grabby arms, not walky arms. Except at least one group, uh, including Ryojasaurus, may have been fully quadrupedal. Oh. So there was some experimentation with walking style among these sauropods. Once again, long necks, relative to the body, even longer than we typically see in the early sauropodomorphs. So think, you know, like a goose or a duck or a swan, a neck that is long, right? Long compared to the torso, compared to the head, maybe as long as one of these animals' arms. Yeah. Long for a normal animal. And they have small heads. Again, proportionately, the, the heads are getting smaller yep. over time with the same plant-eating teeth. This group is really significant. I want to take a moment and appreciate prosauropods. In the late Triassic into the early Jurassic, so around 200 million years ago and a bit before and a bit after, prosauropods were the dominant herbivores around the world. Yeah, they were already the big dinosaurs. <laughs> this is the first time dinosaurs dominated something. Yeah. Like, this is before we're seeing your big impressive theropods. It's before we're seeing your big impressive hadrosaurs, stegosaurs, things like that. And they were already all over the world. Platyosaurus is in Europe, Massospondylus in South Africa, Ryojasaurus in Argentina, Cetad in North America, Lufengasaurus in China, Glacialosaurus from Antarctica. Yep. Now, of course, this was the t uh, Pangaea was in full form at this time, so it's not like they had to cross a lot of oceans. That commuting was a lot easier. But they became very widespread. They are in all sorts of different ecosystems, all sorts of different environments. In some communities, they are apparently up to 95% of the known biomass Whoa. of their ecosystems. And the reason that I want to point this out is that prosauropods did the dinosaur thing. Mm -hmm. The thing dinosaurs are famous for being huge and dominant in their ecosystems and all over the world and super successful. This group did it before any other group. Yes. Before they were even sauropods, they were already the largest and most dominant animals on land. Which I, I love because it means that they they stepped into that role right in the beginning and then continued to be... They never gave it up. <laughs> yep. They just, and just as the proportions changed, they... All right, I will just have to get bigger to maintain this title. <laughs> Among these prosauropods, we start to see the early hints of true sauropods. There are a, a number of different species that are either, depending on who you ask and whose phylogeny you're using, the earliest true sauropods or near sauropods, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. including some like Lampugsaura, Lidamahati, Lesemsaurus. What's notable about these is that they start to look more quadrupedal more reliant on all four legs for walking, and some of them get big. Over 10 meters long, 30 feet plus, and coming in at several tons. These are starting to look elephant-sized. Truly massive land animals. And that's how sauropods started. Yeah. Depending, again, on whose definition you're using, there's, it's always hard to nail down exactly when a group starts because where we put the name is arbitrary. The earliest true sauropods show up either in the late Triassic or the early Jurassic before giving rise to the group as we will come to know them. They start out at rhino to elephant sized animals as they get started. And after the break, we will take a little tour of true sauropod evolution and diversity. The rise of sauropods happens across the late Triassic to the early Jurassic and as true sauropods evolve, they start to develop some of these familiar sauropod features. For one, their skulls 
keep getting smaller. Itty bitty compared to the body. Proportionate to the body. The snouts become shorter and rounder. The teeth ultimately transition from those early spiky leaf-shaped teeth to smooth spoon-shaped teeth. Yeah. Better for nipping at food rather than cutting and slicing. And they develop a wide gape of the jaw. They are able to open their jaws wider than their ancestors. Oh. Which feeds into a strategy that they are developing. One of the driving patterns of sauropod evolution is a shift towards what is called bulk browsing. Yeah. Which is to say, just eating as much as you possibly can. Right, we're seeing the, the, the wide gape of the mouth. We're seeing the simplification of the teeth because they don't have time for chewing. Yeah. That's not what we're here to do. Scoop up food, scoop up leaves, scoop up whatever plants you're eating, swallow it, and your stomach stones and your organs will take care of the rest of it. Just digest it over the next however many days. (laughs) Do it. Uh, We have gastroliths from sauropods, so stones that, that would have been in their gizzard like a bird. But another major part of this bulk browsing strategy is that while they are evolving smaller skulls, they are also evolving longer necks. Mm -hmm. Eventually, uh, most sauropods will end up having at least 12 neck vertebrae. Some end up with many more. Sauropods actually use different, two different strategies in conjunction for lengthening the neck. They do the snake strategy, which is add more vertebrae. Copy, paste, copy, paste, copy, paste. And they do the giraffe strategy, which is stretch the vertebrae out longer. Because por qué no los dos? Okay, why, why not do both? The longer neck means you can reach more food without having to try as hard, which is great when you want to bulk browse. We're also seeing changes in the legs. The front limbs become more column-like, more elephant-like. Mm-hmm. The hands ultimately lose their grasping ability, they, the ancestral dinosaur grabby hands and become uh, feet that leave a horseshoe-shaped footprint because their their fingers are arranged in this horseshoe shape that just... Yeah, all the bones just coming straight down make a little stamp. Meanwhile, the back feet are becoming shorter, more, again, elephant-like. Very elephant-like. And they have a big fleshy foot pad on the foot, like elephants do. And we know that from back foot footprints. Yeah. They have this fleshy pad to support uh, the heel. And, of course, they get bigger. By the middle Jurassic, sauropods are commonly reaching sizes of 15 to 20 meters long, right? 40 to 50 feet and beyond, 60 feet in that case, and with estimated weights of around 10 to 15 tons. Already the biggest dinosaurs ever at the beginning and Tied at best for the largest land animals of all time. Yes. Also by the mid-Jurassic, prosauropods disappear. And true sauropods take over the world. Yeah. They end up spreading all over the planet. Some of the early branching groups of sauropods include some famous names, like Volcanodon from Zimbabwe, which is an important early sauropod, early Jurassic, often studied for what it can tell us about early sauropods. Shunosaurus from late Jurassic China had a club at the end of its tail. Yeah, Because why not? I love that one. Uh, the Mamenchisauridae, which is a big group that eventually includes the genus Mamenchisaurus, which are famous, and this is going to sound weird, for having really long necks. Yes. Even for sauropods. Yes. Some uh, uh, Mamenchisaurus necks were commonly up to Half of their body length. Like total. <laughs> like total body length. Ha- the halfway point of these animals was their shoulder. Yes! Some of these had the longest, among the longest necks among sauropods. 10 meter long necks, 30 foot necks, with the biggest ones estimated at closer to 15 meter, 50 foot long necks, which it should be stressed is longer just the neck than basically any other land-dwelling animal yep. that isn't a sauropod or a tapeworm. Yeah. And it's, I've like, whenever you, if you look up uh, a reconstruction of, of these sauropods, this group, any member, 
it, it they look so off balance. Yeah. Like, how in the world you are should you, tip over? You should be just driving that neck into the ground <laughs> like a bulldozer. And they say, nope, got this big old body behind me to yep. counterweight. It's just, just dense. <laughs> but most sauropod diversity is in the, the this big group called Neosauropoda, the new sauropods, so to speak. This includes most of the, fam- name a sauropod that you are familiar with, and it's probably in this big group. These sauropods, we see further changes to the teeth. The teeth become concentrated at the front of the mouth, mm-hmm. not in the back, and they lose that overbite where the teeth slice past each other, and they meet tip to tip. These are teeth for cropping and nipping at food. Yeah. Just we- ning, 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 ning. We're not here to chew. We are here to inhale our food. These sauropods also show another famous sauropod trait, which is that the nares, the nasal openings in the skull, move to the top of the skull. Yeah. Which you may have seen many reconstructions of these animals as having nostrils at the top of their skulls, which is probably not true. Yeah, because all of the old books showed it with just a nose on the top. Yep. And that often went along with them being in water and it acted like a snorkel. Yep. And there'd be all sorts of discussions I remember reading about like, how, what were they even using it for up there? Mm -hmm. Uh, That's how it is in a Jurassic Park when the Brachiosaurus sneezes on Lex out of its, the top, above its eyes, dome nostrils. But more recent research shows that that's probably not true. Mm -hmm. Uh, The nasal passages probably ran down to the snout. Yes. So the skull opening was up at the top of the skull, but then a passage went down to the snout where, you know, they could smell with them because that's what nostrils are for. Yep. And this probably ties into the same reasons we see lots of dinosaurs with complex, lengthy nasal passages. Helpful for circulating air, for cooling the skull, possibly also good for making loud noises. Yeah. But at the end of the day, these are for smelling because that's where your food is. Yep. Is above your mouth. The Neosauropoda includes two major branches. On the one hand, the Diplodocoidea. The most famous family of these are the Diplodocids, or Diplodocids, or Diplodocids. Don't at me, dinosaur bros. (laughs) This includes some of the most famous, especially North American dinosaurs. Diplodocus, Barosaurus, Apatosaurus, Uh, Famous from places like the Morrison Formation here in North America in the late Jurassic. Yeah. They had peg-like teeth, very long necks in many cases, and famously very long tails that tapered at the end like a whip. Yeah, just into these ribbon-thin, whippy tail tips. And there's been lots of discussion about what those whippy tail tips were for. The obvious and very common one is... Hitting things. Yep. Right? For defense. No one wants to get smacked by a 20, 30 foot long tail. Yes. That whip at you. One of the documentaries famously portrayed the other suggestion of the bull crack, uh, the, the bullwhip crack. Yes. Uh, using them to make a noise. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Cracking the tail. That it actually could act like a whip and would achieve breaking the sound barrier to create that whip crack. Yep. Whether or not that's true has been the subject of many biomechanical discussions. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Another interesting thing about Diplodocus and friends is that some have noticed that their center of mass of their bodies is closer to the back legs, which some argue in support that they may have been able to rear up on their hind legs. Why a sauropod needs to rear up on its hind legs is a whole discussion. (laughs) To look intimidating. Yeah, to make itself look big. (laughs) A closely related group among the Diplodocoidea is the Dicreosaurs, which also had whip-like tails, but had, for sauropods, short necks. Mm -hmm. They're still sauropod necks, but relatively shorter necks. Often are inferred to be possibly eating low vegetation, but they make up for it by having sweet decorations up and down the neck. Yes! Namely, high neural spines sticking up off the vertebrae. Dicreosaurus is like this. Amargosaurus is like this. One of my favorites. This is the one that had these really high spines that have been interpreted as a twin sail Mm -hmm. down the length of the neck. 
uh, also includes uh, Bahadasaurus, which we mentioned in a news not too long ago, that may have had forward pointing spines yep. off of the neck. Because why not? <laughs> this is a group that was very common in the early Cretaceous. And I mentioned that they are interpreted as low vegetation feeders. They often live alongside other groups of sauropods that may have fed higher. Oh, cool. This is actually really common among sauropod communities where we will see in the same formation, the same environment, multiple groups of sauropods that likely were feeding at different heights. Sauropod niche partitioning. Niche partitioning. So you're divvying up the food resources so that you can live in the same place. I love it. It's like how there are tons of different kinds of gazelles in Africa today that all overlap in their ranges but there's short ones mid ones and tall ones yeah and they don't end up competing for food all the time because they can go after very different foods but these are just massive versions of that exactly and i love it (laughs) the last big group of diplodocoids that i want to mention are the rabakisaurids which includes nigersaurus from africa among others and i just want to point out that these are the this is the group that has the flared out snout so that the front edge of the the snout is horiz like it is is straight oh yes yes side to side and all the teeth are only along that front edge where they have a comb they have a comb it's they're so weird well what they look like is those those wide mouth hair clips yeah exactly that's what they look like (laughs) just for raking in food i guess (laughs) for holding up hair so you have your diplodocoids on one side, Diplodocus and that family were very big, literally and figuratively, in the late Jurassic. The other two groups were common into the Cretaceous period. The other major division of Neosauropoda are a group called Macronaria, named for their especially big nasal openings. Big noses. Big noses. Because paleontologists never skip a chance to call dinosaurs names. That's right. They know. They, they, we're not pretending. All right. Tell us about these big noses. There are two major groups of Macronaria that I want to mention. The first is the Brachiosaurus. Woo! Brachiosauridae, including some famous late Jurassic names. Brachiosaurus Mm -hmm. from here in North America. Giraffa Titan from Africa. Good name. Luso Titan from Europe. This group Uh, One of their weirdest features is that their front legs are longer than their back legs. Yeah. So it gives them this sloped back like a giraffe, Mm -hmm. like a hyena. And then, of course, they, uh, as we mentioned, have very long necks. Again, especially long necks, even for sauropods, that are often depicted as being held more upright. Yes. Making them some of the tallest animal. In fact, the tallest animals. That have ever lived on the planet. Yeah. Uh, however, I, I I have to make a note that this group also includes Europasaurus. Well, sometimes it includes, once again, depending on who you ask, Europasaurus is either in this group or close to it. Yes. From late Jurassic Germany, which is one of a few examples of a dwarf sauropod. Yee! Interpreted as having lived on an island ah. in Europe at the time and Island dwarf sauropod. How itty bitty was it? Which was only a mere and adorable six meters long, Aww. 20 feet or so, and probably weighed a tiny two tons. It's just like petite. It's like a rhino. Yeah. Just the size Aww. of a rhino. Like cuddle with it. <laughs> it's, a, it's a lap sauropod. These are among the smallest sauropods. This is about as small as sauropods go. <laughs> <laughs> I I would love if there was like you were talking to all of sauropods and you're like, so can you like, you know, show me how small you can get. They're like, here you go. And you're like, no, like, like really small. And they're like that. Yeah. yeah. We don't understand. We almost stepped on this guy on the way in. Yeah. What do you mean smaller than that? <laughs> this is <laughs> like still a- you small. That's impossible. <laughs> That's we not- couldn't. How, how do you even. We don't like understand this? how you, how you work. And then speaking of sizes, the other group. Within the Macronaria, one of the most famous groups within sauropods are the Titanosaurs. Titanosaurs. This group includes the two that we were geeking out about at the beginning of the discussion, Patagotitan, Argentinosaurus, and many others. This group, whereas most of the really famous ones we've mentioned so far were Jurassic, 
this group really gets its start in the early Cretaceous and becomes the major group of herbivorous dinosaurs, especially in the south, yes. southern continents, right up until the end of the Cretaceous. These have pencil-like teeth, like Diplodocus and friends, big wide pelvises, which has led some to suggest that maybe these also were rearing up on their hind legs. Mm -hmm. But again, uh, disputes. No, they're popping up so they could talk to pterosaurs. Yeah. <laughs> so they could look up over the trees. Yes. You know, like so a they... meerkat. You know, one of them had to, to What's look What's going on in North America? <laughs> <laughs> a few really interesting features show up in, in the titanosaurs. One is that some of them, like Saltosaurus, had osteoderms. Yes. Along their backs. Bone armor in the skin. Another weird feature... I noticed the first time I went to visit Patagotitan, I was looking at this animal. I, I'm standing in front of it, because that's where you stand. Underneath its neck, looking at its legs. And I'm looking down its leg, and I notice that it has a humerus, mm -hmm. upper arm bone. It's got a radius and ulna, as you'd expect, yep. lower arm. A bunch of wrist bones. And then below the wrist in your hand, there are these long bones between your wrist and your fingers. Yep. Called metacarpals. That's the, the part between the wrists and the knuckles. Yep. Hand bones. And that's where it ended. Yeah. On this. Di and I was like, either I'm mistaken. Surely this dinosaur has been put together wrong because it doesn't have any fingers. Yeah. Why doesn't it have toes? Apparently, some titanosaurs, it, it was common among titanosaurs to reduce the fingers in the hand. Some of them completely lost their manual phalanges. The hand ended at the first knuckle. Yep. These were obligate knuckle walkers. <laughs> I had the exact <laughs> same experience looking at Argentinosaurus and just going, one of these feet is not like the other. Yeah, someone messed up. <laughs> yeah, this is, it looks so weird. It's so bizarre. They're just missing part of the hand. Well, it's just walking on the tips of bones. It's just yeah. like. Now, now they would have had, you know, Yes, flesh down there would have there. been stuff underneath it, but, but yeah, but still they took knuckle walking to the extreme. It's it's just like it's like having a peg leg, except you have five of them <laughs> <laughs> all pointing down in the same way. I should of course mention that among the Titanosaurs, there is Megurosaurus from late latest Cretaceous Romania, also an island dwarf, also a mere twenty feet six meters long, and weighing perhaps as little as one ton. Aw, see, this is a, a good sore pod for your backyard. Yeah, this is that's a... Well, you could, you know, for your ranch. Yeah. This is a cow-sized sore pod. <laughs> now, at this point, people who are familiar with titanosaurs might be expecting me to go on and point out that the titanosaurs include several contenders for largest land animal of all time. Yeah, not just largest dinosaur. No, no. Largest land animal ever. A category of sauropods that I have seen referred to as super giants. <laughs> yep. And they do, right? Argentinosaurus and Patagotitan, Puertosaurus, Futalancosaurus, and more. Several titanosaur taxa that have been uh, estimated with lengths well over 30 meters. Over 100 feet, sometimes significantly more mm -hmm. than 100 feet, 30 meters, and weights 50 tons and up. Sometimes way more than 50 tons. That is true. Titanosaurs include some of these inc ridiculously huge species, but so do other groups. Yeah. Among the Diplodocus family, the Diplodocus, certain specimens of Diplodocus and Supersaurus have also been estimated at similar lengths and similar weights. Well, because Super Source was what all my kids' books listed. Yep. Before Argentinosaurus and Patagotitan were discovered, Super Source was always the one yeah. the books listed. And it, it has the name. Mm -hmm. Super Saurus. Dun, dun, dun. But that's not it. There are also super giants among the Mementisaurids, among the Brachiosaurids, possibly among the Rabachisaurids, and others. And this is a point that one of the most incredible things about sauropods, we're so used to, to picturing one group that did the thing. Mm -hmm. Like pterosaurs, episode 79, we talked about how there are a handful of super giant pterosaurs, flying yes. animals 
Quetzalcoatlus, Aramborgiania, that are all part of the same group of pterosaurs, possibly closely related to each other. That's not the case with supergiant sauropods. These incredibly huge, massive sizes evolved several times. Yep. This wasn't like a one-off fluke, one group managed it. This was a fairly normal thing for sauropods to do, was to be longer than a blue whale (laughs) and weigh as much as several elephants. Yep. Which is one of the most amazing... These dinosaurs blow my mind. uh, They are... Once again, when we were saying at the beginning of the episode that they're so popular, we've become numb to their features... You know, we're just all, it's like, yeah, big, long-necked dinosaurs, sauropods. Yeah. We, I've seen them since I was a kid. But they are so big and so weird because, like, not only are they massive, but they've been massive the whole time. Oh, yeah. They, were, they have been hitting these sizes since at least the late Jurassic to the, like, for about a hundred million years. Yes. They were regularly hitting these sizes and and then diverse diverse super giant it's so it's just until you stand next to one of the skeletons it's hard to appreciate how big they actually are and then the fact that this was not actually weird for them no it's weird among the rest of life (laughs) but for sauropods it wasn't which is bizarre and thus brings up the if i may big question about sauropods. Yep. Why and how did they manage this? What made them so special that they were able to achieve this incredible accomplishment of being just stupid big? Yeah, why did this group out of no others reach these sizes? And 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 what were you doing with it? <laughs> <laughs> now, in terms of evolutionarily like what drove you to those sizes? There's a lot of easy answers to that. Being big has its benefits. Yes. You can access lots more food. You can travel long distances. You're protected from predators. It pays to be big. It's all the same things we typically say about whales. Oh, yeah. And elephants and all big things. There are also costs that come with being big. Mainly, you need more stuff. You require more energy. You need more food. You need more space. You need more resources. It's harder to maintain A big body. Yeah. Big bodies also tend to overheat. Yes. We talk about this with dinosaurs a lot. Thermal regulation is is a bit more difficult. But the the bigger question is, how did you do it? Now, if you look up these questions, if you start looking around the internet, you will come across some common suggestions that are probably not true. Or at the very least, they are dubious. A lot of the time, uh, people will try to attribute their size to atmospheric conditions yeah high temperatures or high oxygen levels i have seen varying results here some some models seem to support that maybe high temperatures or high oxygen played a role others less so one that i've also seen is that atmospheric conditions may especially things like carbon dioxide in the atmosphere may not have supported sauropods but plant growth oh good point which I've seen suggested here and there, uh, which which seems, at least from what I've read, maybe better supported than a direct impact on yes. the dinosaurs. One that I see come up a lot is that gravity was lower back then. Not true. What? Not true. That is not, no, that's not true. It's Well, Earth's put on a lot of weight. <laughs> Earth has lost a lot of weight. We got yeah. rid of all the sauropods. Yeah. <laughs> Another old idea is that they just lived really long and grew really big. Yeah. Right, that they just kept growing, right? That that reptile trope that you keep growing until you're huge. That indeterminate growth. But histology research has been done on sauropod bones to study their growth, and which and his, it has found that, like most dinosaurs, they grew real quick. Yeah, they had fairly short uh, adolescences. That they were, even the biggest sauropods were probably reaching maturity, reaching near maximum size in a few decades. Yeah. 20, 30 years or so. Which, the low end of that is when we <laughs> reach our maximum size. Yep, that means that if you, if, if in a Dinotopia situation, you were given a baby sauropod 
Yep. <laughs> at birth, you two could p- potentially be hitting puberty and maturity at about the same age. Yep. You, you, and several of your friends could ride the sauropod to the voting booths. Yes. Or to buy cigarettes or whatever, you know, ad- adolescents. Uh, Dinotopians do. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> so those are some discarded or maybe dubious ideas. Some more popular ideas that I have seen suggested include the stance of sauropods. Mm-hmm. They stand parasagitally, which means their legs are under the body. Column-like legs. Great for supporting the body. And when we say column-like legs, that's referring to the columns of a building being supportive directly under the weight-bearing parts of the building. Yes. This was likely very important for supporting sauropod weight, better than sprawling out to the side like a gator or a lizard. Yeah, because now your forces are acting in two directions, and that's physics-wise a lot more stress on the system. Right. If your legs are straight under you, then you can rest in that position. Yeah. All the weight goes straight down, no other direction. Probably helpful. Definitely not the only thing. No. Because mammals are like that. Yeah. Other dinosaurs are Elephants like are like that. <laughs> yep. Another thing that would have helped sauropods is their skeletal structure. Not only are they reinforced, you know, like I said, those legs and feet are built to support lots of weight, but also their bones are pneumatized. We talked about this in episode 37 where the bone interior structure is reformatted so that you have lots of empty spaces and the bone is concentrated into these sturdy struts. Yeah. Which is a way of making the bone stronger without adding more weight. Yes. Once again, probably very important for their size, for supporting an animal of that size, but other dinosaurs have that. Another consideration with those pneumatized bones is what was inside those hollow spaces. Sauropods had air sacs. Yeah. Like birds, like therapy, you know, T-Rex and Velociraptor and so. The air sacs are part of the respiratory system. Sauropods had very extensive air sacs in many cases, infiltrating parts of the body that we don't often see in other dinosaurs, like the ribs or the tail vertebrae. Weird. And because they had air sacs, not only does that mean that your bones are full of air in many places instead of, you know, tissue, which would be heavier, but that they also probably had a very bird-like breathing system. Very efficient. Very efficient. Very good at taking in oxygen, which is fuel for your metabolism. Fuel for running your body. Mm -hmm. Air sacs also increase the surface area inside your body for heat exchange. Yeah. We talked about big animals tend to build up heat, Yes, right? A big body tends to lose heat more slowly. Air sacs are great for passing heat off into the breath as you exhale it. Yep. Air is a a great heat exchange. That's why we use air to cool things all the time. Yep. This, again, probably, possibly even essential for sauropod size, this efficient respiratory system. Yes. Uh, Possibly also helpful in other dinosaurs for getting as big as they did. Another suggestion that has been pointed out for sauropods as as different specifically from mammals is the way that sauropods reproduce. Mm-hmm. Even the biggest mammals are spending tons of their resources making babies. Yes. An elephant carries a fetus for almost two years mm-hmm. and then after it's born has to take care of it. Yes. As far as we can tell sauropods weren't doing that. We have lots of sauropod eggs. We know sauropods laid eggs, like, as far as we can tell, all dinosaurs. Mm -hmm. Usually in clutches of several eggs. So a little sauropod nest of a bunch of eggs. The eggs of sauropods are typically less than 20 or so centimeters in diameter, right? Nine or 10 inches. So they started out really tiny. Yeah, which is still very big for an egg. Big for an egg. But not big for a sauropod. (laughs) The fact that they had clutches of eggs and small hatchlings is similar to what we see in a lot of animals that don't care for their young. Yes. At least not extensively. And we have no evidence of parental care, convincing evidence of parental care in sauropods, which suggests that part of their life strategy was producing small eggs and self-sufficient babies, Mm -hmm. which frees up a lot of energy for doing your own thing. Yeah. 
it makes me think of turtles immediately mm-hmm. and that you can have the you know like a massive galapagos tortoise still lays like ping pong ball sized eggs with these little itty bitty tortoise babies yes and, you know it's, it's just comical seeing the size difference <laughs> and that you could have that with sauropods where they're laying these nests the eggs hatch and then these little sauropodlings scurry off yeah they go on a, a mad dash for the forest like yeah. in I, that was in one of the documentaries yeah, one of uh, walking with dinosaurs did it that way was they it? Yep. <laughs> they live a forest dwelling life away from the adults until they're big enough to come back out onto the plains another thing that i read um uh, that has been pointed out is that if you have many babies and they grow fast it means you have a high population recovery yeah which means that if e- environmental conditions change or something goes wrong, there's lots of fast-growing babies out there that can recover the community, recover the population, which might make you more survivable as a group over time. Yeah. That this this is a good long-term survivability strategy for the species, which I thought was pretty cool. Now, of course, basically everything we've just said, probably very important for sauropods, maybe even essential for them to have been as they were, but they share these traits with lots of other animals. Yeah, none of those are unique to sauropods. So many discussions end up talking about what I think is possibly the most interesting aspect of sauropod lifestyles is their diet and feeding strategy. Yes. As we mentioned before, one of the major trends in sauropod evolution is the specialization for bulk browsing, Mm -hmm. getting as much food as possible with as little energy as possible. Tiny heads, simple teeth, no chewing, swallow a bunch of rocks, have a giant body that's just a fermentation container, a digestion machine, and just shovel in food as much as you can. And a major part of that is their necks. Long necks make you extremely efficient at gathering food because it means you can stand in one place and just get... I remember a story around here several years ago of a farmer who had caught a black bear in his cornfield and had shot it, sadly, sadly for the bear. And when the when they went out to collect the bear, the bear was, had been sitting in the cornfield and there was no corn in a radius of arm's reach of one black bear around the bear, it had squatted down and just grabbed all the corn it could. Absolutely. A sauropod has a neck that is meters upon meters long that can potentially reach not only side to side, but up and down. Yes. So yeah, you just have this huge span of options from where you're standing. A sauropod can walk up to the trees stand there for a while, vacuum up everything in sight, and then take several steps and do it again. Yes. Another benefit of necks is that, again, they provide lots of surface area for heat loss. Yes. Not only on the outside, but also all those air sacs on the inside. So those long necks might also be really important for conditioning, for air airflow, for, for thermoregulation like those big nasal passages, are losing heat to keep the brain from overheating, to Mm -hmm. keep the skull from getting too hot. One uh, point in support of the idea that the necks were really important is that there is also a general trend that the smallest sauropods had the shortest necks. Yeah. Like those dicreosaurs, for example, had relatively short necks. And this is a suggestion that I think is fascinating because A, that is is something unique to sauropods. That is something that sets them apart. But B, the idea... For for me, I've always pictured sauropods as these real big animals that were strangely shaped. Yes. It It never occurred to me to connect the idea that their necks might be an important reason why they got to that size. Absolutely. That that it, it that body shape. We think of the shape as so weird. It's such an odd shape. Nothing today is shaped like that. And then there's that corollary. Yeah, nothing today is sized like that either. Once you make that connection, it almost seems obvious that like this was a successful shape. Yeah. A a, a competitive and versatile 
shape for an herbivore. Yeah. That may have been a big part of what allowed them to be the biggest land animals ever. Which is utterly fascinating. Mm-hmm. They are a, a just an incredibly unique and bizarre group of animals. And that's not even getting into all the questions of how that size affected how they did things. Oh, yeah. How they moved. I've seen a bit of discussion that has pointed out, uh, that has tried to do like, how could they walk? Which seems to often come to the conclusion that they could walk, but that's it. Yep. There probably were not very many running sauropods. Yeah, you didn't have a, <laughs> a sauropod stampede was no no faster than a sauropod mosey. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Just extraordinarily fascinating animals. And as is often the case with episodes like this, we have scratched the surface of what there is to be said about sauropods. They are, they're just so, listen, if Deinonychus didn't exist, yes. they'd way up their top contenders for favorite group of dinosaurs. Well, it's, I, I distinctly remember as a kid finding sauropods one of the more boring groups, just because they don't have any sharp claws, they don't have horns. Yeah, they're not exciting. Yeah, they're not, they're, I mean, there are decorated ones, but they're not as decorated as many other groups. And that was what was more interesting to me. And then... In the second Dinotopia book, I think it is, uh, <laughs> World Beneath, there's a scene where they they go on a like supplies caravan between cities to move stuff, and they they take the trip on an armored sauropod. Yeah, that's like decked out with decked out with plate armor, and then has this. Are they called ho- hodas? Uh, how does like, like a platform? The up platform, on top. the mm-hmm. little house <laughs> on top of the back. <laughs> And I saw that and went, that's pretty awesome. Yeah. And since then, I've I can't I've never been able to shake that these were just massive moving fortresses of animals, right. just land whales, land whales, actual kaiju. Yes. And once again, Walking with Dinosaurs did a great thing where they had little rampharinkid pterosaurs clinging to their sides, and so that they were just carrying this environment with them as yeah. they went. Yeah. Which absolutely, of like, of course. You know, if elephants are environment engineers reshaping the landscape, can you even imagine? (laughs) In fact, that's a great segue to our patron question. Woo! One of the benefits that we offer on Patreon, at a certain level, you can ask us questions to answer on the podcast. And as it happens, we have a sauropod question among our patron questions, and it seemed like the episode to do it. It's fitting. Will, what is that patron question? This question is from LR, who says, I wondered if any research has ever been done on the effects of large sauropods on landscapes. Ooh, very topical. Mm -hmm. Given that at least some of these dinosaurs are believed to have traveled as herds, coupled with their obscene size. Good word for it. (laughs) Yes. It seemed like they could have set the vegetation back a couple of stages of succession in a short period of time. I've looked for information about this, but it seems scarce. I just wondered if the aspect of paleoecology has ever been discussed or studied much, even in theory. Excellent question. Yes. Fascinating question. I did some digging and I didn't find a lot of direct research on this. Mm -hmm. I'm sure that some models have been done, but I did find a a study from 2009 that was discussing sauropod abundance, uh, particularly in the Morrison Formation. But there is a section of the paper that discusses the ways that they would have been keystone species. Yes. Environmental engineers, like you mentioned with elephants. Among the things they mention are, A, that the mere act of walking would have disturbed soil, would have disturbed short plants, right? The undergrowth. If a sauropod walked through a forest, you now have a trail through that forest. Yep. Well, and like, I'm picturing their feet creating little potholes in loose soil. That is the other thing that they mentioned. That, yeah, their footprints would create microhabitats. Yep, little puddles. Little puddles uh, for things that could live there that are different from what is in the soil normally. Well, because like, there are frogs and other amphibians that rely on little pools of water like like that. You know, about that size. Mm -hmm. Forming and lasting for just long enough. For them to lay eggs, eggs to hatch, tadpoles to turn into frogs and leave. Yep. And that would, big footprints left in a soft 
you know, field or, or, or landscape would be perfect for that. Oh, yeah. And sauropod footprints could be big. Yes. <laughs> I, I want to say the biggest sauropod footprints are well over a meter. I I, th- I want to say I've seen some that meter and a half, maybe two. Don't Jeez. quote me on that. Oof. Big feet. Yeah. Obviously, sauropods would be eating plants. Mm-hmm. The way that this paper uh, described it is that uh, a sauropod could easily destroy entire patches. Yeah. <laughs> Of food plants. So absolutely they are disrupting the vegetation. And indeed, <laughs> they mentioned that a sauropod could do that. But if they're traveling in herds, to quote from the paper, uh, this this paper is by James Farlow et al., by the way. I'll put it in the blog post since we're talking about it so much. A herd of sauropod could have constituted roving hotspots of intense impact. Yeah, yeah. Separated by intervals of time with little or no presence of the sauropods. Mm-hmm. That they, it could just go through a forest and just leave destruction in its wake and then come back sometime in the distant future. So absolutely having that effect of recycling, uh, refreshing the state of the forest. Absolutely. They also make the point that sauropods would have produced copious amounts of poo yep that would have been concentrations of nutrients and that's something that's key for large herbivores is that not only are they creating fertilizer every time they relieve themselves yep transporting nutrients but they're moving it yeah i can eat food here and then i may walk across you know a very you know a fairly barren place to get to the next good place and leave nutrients that makes that place a little less barren. Oh, yeah. For the next group of animals to come by. And if you think about how many decomposers there are that rely on that, I think dung beetles and mm-hmm. all the things that live in poop, tons of arthropods and fungi and certainly microbes, each sauropod poop could be a surprisingly large ecosystem built on decomposers. Yeah. And speaking of decomposers... The other thing that they mention is that a sauropod carcass Mm -hmm. would be as they, I love this, they use the phrase trophic bonanza. (laughs) Yes. (laughs) Basically a whale fall on land. It's a sauropod fall. Well, and to give an example of a whale fall on land, when whales do wash up on shore, it draws predators from miles. Oh, yeah. Wolves, bears, gulls, you know, bird, you know, decomposer birds, you know, buzzards and vultures. Yeah. From all over. An ecosystem sprouts up mm-hmm. built around this carcass and, they, and it can last for a long time. Yes. So, yeah, if a sauropod dies, that enriches an entire ecosystem that's going to be built around that for a while. You could easily have, you know, today there are... Uh, whale fall communities there are organisms that we mostly or sometimes only see at whale falls yep you can imagine there being organisms that spent their existence traveling from sauropod carcass to sauropod carcass stopping for other things along the way now of course whale falls are unique because they are the only major source of nutrition in the deep sea yes sauropods wouldn't quite be like that but Easy to imagine how a carcass could enrich a community and then fertilize the ground beneath it. Well, First, the... it would kill the ground beneath it. Oh, and yes. then maybe later <laughs> yep. new stuff could grow. Well, and it, it immediately makes me think of um, the Andean condors, which mm-hmm. are thought to have been adapted for feeding off of mega herbivore carcasses. And then when we lost the mega herbivores, it partially threatened their survivability. And so when we have these giant pterosaurs or giant predators, now you could have ones that are relying on finding dead sauropods as a cornerstone to their diet. Yeah, imagine uh, big pterosaurs soaring across the landscape looking for sauropod carcasses. Exactly. So in my mind, the size of a sauropod almost helps to explain the ridiculous sizes of other <laughs> animals during this time. Absolutely. It's definitely been suggested for carnivore sizes. Yeah. Like, you now have this source of meat that can support something the size of a T-Rex, and not just one, like, yeah. a sauropod carcass could, everywhere. could support multiple tyrannosaurs on that one body, 
and still have stuff left over to rot. <laughs> One other note that I I, I want to point out, I found a 2012 study that tried to estimate the amount of methane that would be produced by sauropods. Yes! So, so methane, farts. Yes, that's farts. Animals release gas. I, I don't want to make any definitive statements here, but their model estimated that sauropod methane production might have rivaled modern day methane production <laughs> including the impact of humans and farming and stuff <laughs> that's a lot of farts and this isn't just like ha 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 funny it would have been smelly in the mesozoic methane's a really important greenhouse gas oh yes no that is a critical part of our atmosphere so it has been suggested and again this is a memorable major claim so i i do want to hedge a little bit here suggested that it's not out of the question that sauropods could have affected the climate absolutely <laughs> just because there would have been so much gas being produced by them so excellent question lr the answer is absolutely these animals would have utterly transformed their ecosystems in so many ways like a herd of elephants per sauropod shaping the land around them shaping ecosystems around them possibly even shaping the air around them yeah yeah you would have known this when there were sauropods nearby. they they were terraforming forces and on that note we can wind down this episode such a cool such a cool group of animals no doubt there they will come up more in the future thank you to everybody who requested this topic excellent suggestion indeed thanks as always to our patrons thanks as always to all of our listeners worry not there will be more dinosaurs in the future check the blog post for pictures and links uh, a lot of the stuff we talked about will uh, describe and add links for more information check out our cool extra stuff uh, our our look back over a hundred episodes look at the q a form in the episode description, send us your questions for the end of the year Q&A. Make your questions heard. We release episodes every fortnight. Mm-hmm. So stay tuned for more. It'll be... I, I can't say it'll be as big. No. But it'll be cool. Yeah, we've already done whales and sauropods now, so... We've maxed out. We uh, Until we get to those, like, communal forests, forests <laughs> and stuff. Yep. We're, we're, we've, we've gotten about as big as we can get for a while. Hit, we've hit the big stuff. But as always, if there's something we didn't get to this in this episode, if there's something you'd like us to go into more detail on, if there's a, a part, a question, a topic you'd like us to, to, to do more of, send us your request. We are always accepting requests and building the list. Absolutely. Thanks again for joining us. We'll see you in a fortnight. Yeah, a couple weeks for the next episode. Bye. Doodles. Bidding do. Thanks for listening to the Common Descent Podcast. You can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and check our WordPress blog for pictures and links after each episode. Huge thanks to our patrons whose support helps keep this podcast running and who get access to bonus goodies on Patreon. The song you're hearing is called On the Origin of Species by Protodome, which we found at ocremix.org. Thanks again for listening. We hope you'll join us next time.